I'm John Decker. I am the Interim Associate General Manager for Content here at KPBS Public Media in San Diego. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here, as you can see uh, in the chat room. Please do, if you haven't already, open up the chat window um, because there will be a lot of uh, important information to come through there. Also, that's where we're going to ask that you submit your questions. Uh, so they're from Heather, if you have uh, any technical issues, you can use a chat box or raise your hand to do that as well. Um, so I've got a few opening remarks and then I'll hand over to our guests and we'll get started talking about funding and distribution. Okay, this is of course the GI Film Festival San Diego and uh, we're gonna be talking about filmmaking. So if you guys are here, um, the, uh, the cooking class is down the hall, just kidding. Um, on behalf of all of us here at KPBS, we are really so happy and pleased that y'all have taken time out of your Thursday to join us for this panel. I think you're really going to enjoy it. We've got some great folks from the public media world, and hopefully we can hear from you too with lots of questions. So keep those, uh, keep those on hand during the chat function. Um, the GI Film Festival 2021 is already underway. We kicked off on Tuesday night. Hope you've had a chance to see a couple of films. If you have not, the uh, festival will run through Sunday evening, a total of 38 films in the festival this year. And I dare say, get, giving, uh, taking a look at the names on the screen here, some of you might even have some films in the, uh, in the festival. Uh, we know some of the directors and writers are with here uh, with us here as well. Thank you to those of you that are member participating in the festival this year. Uh, thank you for submitting. It's uh, you know this wouldn't be successful without you. Let's see um, some housekeeping notes. This meeting is being recorded, uh, so we'll share a link with all registered guests at the conclusion of this. If you want to revisit some of those ideas and look at the uh, at the presentations. As we move through the panel presentations, there will be some opportunities to ask questions. When that happens, simply raise your hand and you'll be asked to unmute yourself to ask the question. Now with 30 some people here, and if you don't all have your uh, cameras on, the best way to do that is to use the hand raise function in the reaction area down at the bottom of the Zoom screen. That's the best way to do it because I'm not always gonna be able to see your hand and or uh, go ahead and put it up in the, uh, the chat window and we do those in order as best we can. Now that the uh, housekeeping um, matters are under uh, behind us, my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, uh, Michael Kinomoto. Michael oversees documentary films in production at ITVS. Um, some of his recent highlights include the Academy Award nominated and Peabody Award winning Mind the Gap, which is a terrific film. Thank you for that, Michael, and the Emmy winning Best of Enemies. So I'm gonna hand it over to you. Michael's got a presentation to share with us and Michael, you have the floor. Thank you, John. And hi, everybody. It's great to be here today. Um, as John mentioned, my name is Michael Kinamoto and I'm the Senior Manager of Production at ITVS. Um, some of you may already be familiar with ITVS, so please bear with me as I'm gonna share a brief overview of who we are and what we do. So uh, next slide, please. Um, ITVS, which stands for the Independent Television Service, was formed 30 years ago and has become public media's leading incubator and presenter of independent film. And we're driven by the conviction that bold storytelling builds a more just society. Um, as you can see from our mission statement, we're dedicated to working with independent producers who are taking creative risks and tackling complex issues and whose stories and teams reflect the voices and visions of underrepresented communities mirroring our diverse society. Also, everything we support ends up on public television, which guarantees that everybody who owns a TV or a computer has a chance to view these stories. Uh, next slide, please. So the common question is, how do I get funded by ITVS? Well, uh, I, I do need to be clear, it's very competitive, but what is good is that we have three different open call initiatives. So that means that if you meet certain eligibility requirements, which are spelled out on our website, and I'll share the link soon, um, 
then anybody can apply and there's really no limit to the number of times you can apply which is different maybe some from others uh, provided that it's you know close to the time that you're completing and premiering your film um, the first of those funds is called the diversity development fund which we uh, call short uh, ddf and that's our uh, r d fund for projects made by diverse which is meaning black and indigenous people of color and that can provide up to twenty five thousand of support the next in our open calls are, is the open call for long form. And that's for uh, documentaries that are an hour or 90 minutes. And we can provide up to 350,000 of production and post-production funding. And also I wanna point out that that fund is currently accepting applications up until June 11th. So if you have a, a film that's in production or you're in editing and, and you wanna see if it's a good match for our fund, I would encourage you to go to itvs.org and, and go to the get funded section and learn more about open call. Another fund that we have is called Short Form Open Call, and that's for both digital shorts that are uh, under 30 minutes a piece, and that would provide up to 40,000, uh, or for a pilot for a short form digital series, and that would be for 25,000. And then if it were green lit, it would be in uh, consideration for additional funding. Uh, so as I mentioned, please go visit itvs.org and click on the Get Funded link to read more about the project eligibility for each of those funds. Uh, next slide, please. If you are thinking about applying to any of our funds, and also I would say uh, to other funding organizations, I would strongly encourage you to visit another organization's website, and that's the International Documentary Association, or the IDA. And when you're on their website, or you could Google this, you want to familiarize yourself with the documentary core application, which is like a template that many of um, the funding organizations, including ITVS, pattern their applications applications after. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just keep in mind that it's not a one size fits all application. So it's not quite, and for those of you who are filmmakers who have applied to festivals, it's not uh, quite like without a box where you can fill out one application and, and click and submit to many at once. Uh, we do encourage you to closely review the instructions and requirements for each funder that you plan to apply to because everybody is looking for something a little different. Uh, next slide, please. So another question that um, <clears throat> that we're commonly asked, uh, that I'm commonly asked in the field, is what kinds of stories is ITVS looking for? And um, I'm afraid my answer is not so simple uh, because we support a wide variety of documentaries and subjects. Um, <clears throat> more broadly, we uh, support character-driven stories. I, I think you'll you'll find that to be kind of a common aspect of many of the films that you'll see uh, represented on our website. Uh, and these, of course, are and back to our mission statement of untold stories reflecting our diverse society, which are creative and original. Um, historic and scientific films driven by expert voiceover are not typically among those that we have funded, but that doesn't mean that we haven't or won't support films in these subject areas. Um, I would also encourage you to visit our website and click on the Our Films link, and that is where you can look at the films that we've supported in the past. Um, in crafting an application, I would also encourage you to answer the questions that are on this slide. And, you know, I think they're all important in terms of what makes, um, what are common aspects of what makes any story emotionally engaging and their, their characters relatable. So the first is, uh, what is the story and the story structure? That's pretty clear. Is it your story to tell? And that's something that has more to do with, you know, if you're coming into a place uh, and you're meeting people and you want to tell their stories, we ask that you have articulated uh, kind of a clear plan that shows that you've established trust. And if there are collaborators in those communities where, you know, you have established with them that they will be kind of uh, collaborators with you in the process. That's important uh, for us to know. Who are the characters? Also very clear. What are their strengths and flaws and what's at stake? Those last two questions, I think, are really fundamental to any story, whether you're making a narrative film or a documentary. So you always want to know, you know, what's at stake? What are they striving for? What happens when they fail? And what will it feel like, you know, when they succeed? And that makes them relatable characters in the story emotionally engaging. Next slide, please. So um, 
the uh, you know the logistical piece of what your plan is is something that we also want to know and most funders want to know and the documentary core application gives you some really specific guidelines for how to articulate that plan um, but that's an important part of a competitive application so you know do you have access to the people and places that you will need to tell this story and that kind of goes in hand in hand with that other question that i mentioned which is is it your story to tell and, and if it's not your own story then how are you collaborating with the people in your film um, you know who do you need on your team and this speaks to crew members, uh, consultants, so forth, uh, and what will it cost to recruit and retain your dream team? Um, how long will it take you to make your film? That's really important. And that also yeah, will inform the budget that you're presenting. And also don't leave out the time that it will take to fundraise and develop your plan, as well as the time it will take to shoot, edit, and distribute your film. Uh, I think an important question also to ask is uh, who are you making this film for and how will you reach them? And some of my um, uh, you know, fellow panelists here today will speak about that important piece. Uh, but will you be able to make money from these exhibitions? If not, you do need to you know, establish what success looks like in terms of your, your film and maybe consider expanding what who your audience is and how you intend to reach those audiences. Next slide, please. So fundamentally, I would just say uh, the difference in terms of working totally independently and then working with a co-producer like ITVS are, are these represented in these slides. So where you are now is you have a lot of freedom because you're on your own. And uh, some filmmakers are able to actually achieve the film uh, really using the resources available to them in, in kind of in a DIY fashion. But if you're making work that sort of is taking it to the next level and is competitive for a national broadcast that's represented on the next slide and that's where working with ITVS uh, I wanted to be clear you know this the way we work is it's not a grant so we don't just hand over the money it's actually a licensing agreement we're actually receiving the U.S. television broadcast rights uh, in your project you retain the rest um, and it really is a business and creative partnership uh, collaboration. So you're gaining a co-production partner to help you produce your film and walk, you know, kind of work through the process. And, and we'll touch on distribution later on today. And that is something that we uh, also, um, you know, can advise on if you're uh, greenlit for ITVS co-production. And uh, I think that is where I'll pause because actually my colleagues are going to, uh, my uh, fellow panelists are going to talk more about the distribution part. But I did want to articulate one important thing, and that is that there is a misconception uh, many times where people think that if you're working with ITVS, that means that you can't sell your film to Netflix or Hulu or Amazon. And, and that's not true. Uh, we actually, you know, what, what I said is true in terms Terms of everything that we co-produce ends up on public TV, but you retain the rights to exploit for festival exhibition, theatrical, non-theatrical, non which is like educational distribution on campus and uh, campuses, and also to sell your film to other um, you know, other platforms. But it is very important to be clear that if you work with ITVS, um, the US television premiere, the television broadcast will be on public TV. And you're going to learn a lot today. It's going to be a real eye opener because there's a lot of good information that Hillary uh, will share um, about what the system really entails in terms of public TV. Um, but I just wanted to be clear about that. And I can answer more questions about that later on. And so with that, I, I'm done. If we have time, okay. I can answer questions or we can wait till later. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, again, everybody, if you've got a quick question for Michael, go ahead and put it up into the chat window as I make my screen a little bit bigger. Um, I've got a quick question for you, Michael. Um, and uh, thank you for explaining how ITVS works as far as that, that relationship. And I think it's important for people to remember that ITVS becomes a distribution agreement, not an ownership agreement necessarily. But it does sound too like you 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 do you would like um, to have some creative input on the project, correct? Can you talk a little bit about the extent to that, what that usually entails, um, how that how that looks a little bit? 
Yeah, that's a great question, John. Um, in fact, we really do expect to have very close uh, collaboration in terms of the editorial feedback. So I have one title that I represented today, but my role in working with the films that are in production is a supervising producer, and I have other colleagues here at ITVS, and we really act as sort of a line producer for our organization in interfacing with the filmmakers who are the ones actually making the films. But we have regular editorial check-ins you know from the very beginning if that's where we're starting our collaboration all the way to the fine cut the filmmakers get final cut but there are certain things you know with public television with broadcasting in the u.s that are subject to certain limitations fcc requirements mm -hmm. and so forth and we have to be a little bit more assertive and saying okay that you can't say that on tv or can't show that on tv but for the most part the pro the program that gets represented on on broadcast is usually quite close to what is represented in festival and theatrical distributions mm -hmm. Um, good question from uh, Jeff Arbio here. Good to see you, Jeff. Uh, one of the local filmmakers. His question is, uh, how uh, I lost it already. Where is? Oh, how, how long does ITVS own the TV rights? Yeah, that is a good question too. So, uh, in a standard open call contract with ITVS, ITVS holds the television rights for four years. And so, typically, we see like a series like POV or Independent Lens will. Uh, actually sub-license it from ITVS for three years, sometimes four, and that, that fourth year is something that's up for negotiation when, you know, we, we end that first sub-license of three years, and um, sometimes it goes back to the filmmakers, or sometimes there's a lot of interest and energy on both sides to say, okay, we want to rewindow this on World, for instance, and, and this is going to be, uh, you know, it's good to know kind of all the different ways that programs are distributed throughout the system that we'll learn today. Thanks, Michael. Jeff, I asked that question for you, and I probably shouldn't have because you're capable of asking the question yourself. Do you have a follow up to that one at all? Nope, can't hear you, though. Okay, moving on. Sai is with us as well. Sai, you've got a question about uh, length. You want to ask that? Yeah, sure. Uh, Michael, thank you for being here. This is great stuff. I just wanted to ask about for the short films under 40 minutes, for the television broadcast, how important is the length of the film to fit a TV format? That's a great question, Sai. So actually, I should be really clear too here. So open call, actually, we will consider uh, programs proposed of 30 minutes and longer, usually between 30 and 90 minutes. And so we have actually supported 30-minute uh, broadcast films. The short form of open call is actually very specific to a uh, distribution that we handle in collaboration with PBS. And that's actually those works uh, will be on PBS YouTube. They have a channel called Voices that recently launched. And before that, it was um, PBS Digital Studios. And so they're all under the umbrella of Independent Lens, which is the series that ITVS uh, co-curates with PBS. And they, they come under that branding. Uh, occasionally, we have seen some of the short films that we've funded in short form open call get additional licensing, a different contract for broadcast, but those are kind of case by case. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's very awful. It's great. Okay, thing. good. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Michael, I've got a quick follow up to, to you, you talk about rights. Uh, as we know, uh, rights encompasses a, really, a much, much more bigger and more complicated picture than it has in the past. You mentioned PBS's YouTube channel. Um, uh, here at KPBS, when we acquire something from a local independent producer, you know, we really try and be as expansive as possible, not just television, but digital and so many other ways, because we're sort of an open source family, right? We want to get it out there as best we can. Can you talk a little bit about what filmmakers have to do to make sure that they have those rights? And keep in mind, too, that if they're maintaining the ownership of the film, then it's their responsibility to get those rights, right? That's a great question. And, and I'll 
keep it brief because I think we'll also touch on this perhaps later. But so in an ITVS agreement, ITVS is going to obtain the broadcast rights on US television, US and, and territories uh, television. There's also a set of rights that are carved out for um, PBS video and also Passport, which is the membership video on demand service for people that donate to their member stations, which is really taking off in popularity. Um, you're right to point out that the filmmakers, at least in the relationship that, that we have with the filmmakers, retain the rest of those rights, but they might decide to sell those rights to another distributor. And so that's where it's really important that the filmmaker and their lawyer really understand the rights that they're carving out and selling to different uh, different representatives because yes, you could make a mistake and then not really own the rights and, and tell KPBS you could stream this on, on on video, but then find out later that those you know might be in conflict with other rights that have been already sold by the filmmaker, one of their representatives. So there's a lot of legal you know part of this that's really important to educate yourself on, and it's really important to you know have a lawyer. If, once you're starting to work at this level of contracting with co-producers like ITVS. Okay, yeah, right. And you're right, we will talk about them more. I'm gonna hand over to Nina. We'll take Nina's question and then if it's okay, we'll move on to the next part. There'll be more time to ask questions later on. Nina, Nina, would you like to, uh, uh, Nina Brissi, would you like to chime yeah. in here with your question? Yeah, hi, Michael, just a quick question. For the shorts, um, for funding, that's strictly documentaries, right? That's not narrative shorts. Yeah, that's a good question. And well, ITVS in the past did, uh, uh, you know, fund narrative work. Uh, we have now really focused our work okay. on nonfiction work. Um, so yeah, in, in a nutshell, that's the answer. But Thank good you. question. Excellent. I'm glad we get that answered for you, Nina. <laughs> um, all right, moving right on. Thank you, Michael. Michael's going to be here for a few more minutes. And again, keep those questions coming. This is an opportunity. Uh, to really kind of delve into some of the uh, concepts that we'll be talking about. I'm going to hand over, and we've got uh, the three remaining guests we have with us, Hilary Buxton from American Public Television, Sarah Bilodeau from PBS Plus, and Jody Silly from uh, Film Consortium San Diego here in town. And I'm going to hand off to each of them in succession, and they've got, uh, they'll be telling you a bit about, about themselves, about uh, the uh, opportunities that they offer, and then we'll have time after each one of them uh, present, we'll have time to uh, uh, ask them questions. Okay. Hillary, you are up first. On to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Everyone can hear me all right. Everything all set? Terrific. All right. Well, good morning again. Good afternoon. If you're here on the East Coast, I'm coming to you live uh, from beautiful Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, I'm with American Public Television. We are Boston based, but I'm on a little bit of a trip. <laughs> but uh, this afternoon, I'm coming to you from Pennsylvania, as I said. So I wanted to give you just a very general overview of the US public television system. American public television is one of a number of distributors to that system. And if you could change the slide for me. Great. So again, the, uh, the US public television can be a complex uh, organization to be able to wade through. The largest player, as you can see here from that very recognizable logo is PBS. And the wonderful Sarah Bellado will be presenting after me and she's gonna go into a little bit more detail on, uh, on PBS and, and how um, her part of things works. But it's important to note that PBS is the major player in the system, but there are others as well. Next slide, please. One really important thing to keep in mind, and this has become my mantra, is that public television is not a network, at least not in the traditional television sense. We are a loosely affiliated member organization. And what that really means is that each market each programmer responsible for that market will be creating a schedule that works best for their own constituencies. And I'm sure John is nodding along with this right now for KPBS. So uh, can you bring up the next bullet please, Claudine? Thank you. So, um, so there are a number of ways that programmers can fill their schedules. And again, that primary player is PBS. Uh, next, American Public Television, which is the organization that I work for. Uh, affectionately known as APT. We have NIDA, 
We have next bullet, please, EPS. And next we have Westlink. And then uh, public television stations sometimes themselves will circulate some of their content to the system nationally, um, uh, just if they have independent productions or they're working uh, with other local entities, they can do that themselves. Next slide. All right. So a little bit more about APT and what we do. I'm realizing that the, uh, the bullets weren't that great of an idea, Claudine, apologies. So we have a number of different programming streams within APT. Uh, the first is syndication. And these are uh, titles that are purchased individually um, by stations. Uh, we have premium service, which deals with fundraising and pledge content, uh, a lot of performance programs and things that you see like that. We, and then we have exchange programming, which is the area that I work within uh, APT. You're going to see a wide variety of content. That's pretty much a subscription library that stations can pull from. We are distributing documentary. We are distributing public affairs programming, uh, lifestyle content, uh, of travel, cooking, um, some of our titles that you might recognize for that area are uh, Rick Steves, Europe, his series, uh, America's Test Kitchen. A lot of those um, popular names and lifestyle are distributed by APT. Next slide, please. Oh, and Create and World, of course. These are multicast channels. And uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a little bit on that. So uh, APT distributes, meaning it handles the business side of two multicast channels, World and Create. Next slide, please. So you can see here, KPBS uses one of its channels to run Create, which is, as you can see there, the premier TV channel for how-to programming. So it's a pre-packaged channel uh, that runs out 24 seven and stations can co-brand and you've got really the best of public television's uh, lifestyle content. And you see a variety of things from here. You'll see America's Test Kitchen, uh, travel, um, arts and crafts, all different types of lifestyle content is run on Create. And this runs in about 80% of the country. Next slide, please. And then we also, um, we are also involved with the World Channel, which is a fantastic uh, channel that, that again is also multicast and we're involved on the business side of things with it. Um, stations will subscribe and again, it is prepackaged. Uh, it runs the best of public television documentary. It also has original content. Um, Stories from the Stage is a wonderful series. They have a lot of ITBS content um, that you just heard uh, Michael talk about. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a second, it can be a second window if you have a general release on public television. Your programs can also wind up on World 2. All right. And what is APT Exchange looking for? Next bullet, thank you. So we will look at concepts and, and projects that are in development uh, with, um, we could give you a letter of interest if you're going to be fundraising for your project. So we do get involved at that level, but primarily what we see is completed, fully funded programming. Uh, we have content that goes out at 30 minutes, 60, 120, um, we, put all lengths out to the system and uh, we're open to reviewing things, but it is usually a minimum of 30. Next slide, please. What we're looking for when you submit to APT is we would love some information on your previous work. We, uh, if you have a reel that you wanted to share, we'd love to see that. Next bullet. Ancillary product. So if, uh, if, you are working with, um, if you have a book that your program is based on, you would have the opportunity to be able to sell the book at the end of your program. Uh, so ancillary product like that is possible in some of the cooking shows that I was just talking about. There are cookbooks that are sold at the end of these programs. So there are opportunities like that. We want to know about additional platforms, especially, uh, you know, digital, if you have um, pieces that go along with your program, interstitials, social media. We want to hear about everything that's happening 
with your content. Next. And of course, uh, we want to talk about exclusivity and rights. And uh, Michael had touched upon this earlier. Uh, right now, APT would be looking to secure rights for US public television broadcast. But things, uh, as you can imagine, in our world are developing so quickly. Uh, Michael had mentioned passport. Uh, there are so, everything is in flux. So we are looking for certain new media rights for certain things. Um, sorry to be vague about it, but um, he gave you a really good tip earlier and that you should keep these things in mind as you're out there in the field um, and as you are planning. And again, working with someone who's a professional, uh, a lawyer or counsel who can deal with these rights to help you secure the right things that you're gonna need for all these different platforms is a must. Next slide. Oh, and uh, yeah, sorry, I skipped a point. <laughs> Apologies, folks. Uh, a presenter or some sort of public television organization who can get behind your, um, your particular project is really important. I know we've presented a lot of information here. And again, public television can be a bit of a maze. So that's why we highly encourage um, producers to get involved with their local public television stations or an organization like ITVS uh, to be able to help guide them through this process. And I am available anytime. My contact information is there. If you have questions, I've been yapping quite a bit, but, uh, but please feel free to follow up with me. I love working with producers and um, I'm excited to see what you have happening. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hillary. Thank you very much. Yes, explaining the public television distribution system can be somewhat challenging and uh, I find myself apologizing for that on a frequent <laughs> <Me> basis. <too. laughs> Hillary, thank you. Okay, so moving right along, we'll go over to Sarah from PBS and uh, she'll tell us a bit about um, distribution uh, from her perspective. And again, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in chat and uh, we'll get to them once we've gone through our presenters at the moment. So Sarah, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, John, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Bilodeau, uh, the director of PBS Plus, and I'm coming to you from Northern Virginia, close to the PBS headquarters. And uh, to follow what Hillary said, it is very tricky to describe the public uh, television system, but Hillary, you did a lovely job. And so I'm just going to focus on uh, the different avenues within PBS. Um, and, you know, so hopefully, you know, I won't confuse you even more. Um, but as you can see from the slide, uh, content comes to PBS through various sources, either from stations, producing partners, or independent filmmakers and producers. Programs can vary between ongoing series, one-off films, or limited series, uh, which are then distributed through the primetime national schedule, Plus, which is what I, what I take care of, our digital studios and at the local level through Station Exchange or Wavelength. All of these are great choices and avenues to pursue. Um, it's kind of about finding what is the best fit for your program, because we all know there are definitely different homes for documentaries, narratives, and of course, shorts programs. Uh, to dive into these platforms a bit more, most viewers are familiar with the PBS national schedule, which is also known as the NPS. Um, we love our acronyms in public television. Uh, programs scheduled on the NPS are distributed nationally to every station, um, but only cover primetime hours each night. Um, and of course, most filmmakers and producers want his or her program to be scheduled on the NPS, but given that there is such limited space available and it really only covers about three hours each night, this leads me to plus. So each year we distribute anywhere between 300 to 400 hours of content through plus. Like the MPS, plus programs are distributed nationally throughout the system. So every station, every station has access to these films and series. The primary difference between the two is that stations have more flexibility with scheduling, um, as plus programs are not beholden to a specific date and time. 
That being said, I am ideally looking for programs that will support the overall national content strategy, the goal being to curate the plus schedule to align with those larger initiatives throughout the year. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean I'm not also looking for those hidden gems that might not necessarily coincide or fit in with our larger themes, but I know will be perfect for our audiences. And while we love our broadcast distribution, uh, PBS um, has made some great strides to expand our multi-platform content, which leads me to digital distribution. So over the past year, our digital studios team was brought under the general audience programming umbrella with the goal to produce uh, more multi-platform content to support these broader initiatives. Uh, we really are looking to build and foster a new generation of talent, both in front of and behind the camera, uh, with the creation of original companion series, as well as a hybrid of broadcast and digital programming series. Digital Studios has over 26 million subscribers and averages 53 million monthly views across our various platforms, such as YouTube, Facebook Watch, Over the Top Streaming, aka PBS Passport, and um, of course, PBS website. Uh, and then finally, at the local level, uh, the station exchange and wavelength were created to answer the question, what are the other stations doing? Both platforms are a collaborative environment for stations to freely share and access locally produced content that we wouldn't necessarily distribute through the MPS or through PLUS. And stations can both uh, contribute and download the content to use on broadcast and online. I know this was a lot of information on PBS distribution, so thank you so much for listening, but I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions during our Q&A session. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, it, it, it might be helpful here just to take a, a break and to explain a couple of things um, so that we can help our audience a little bit understand. So NPS stands for the National Program Schedule. And at a local station level, we, you know, KPBS in San Diego, for example, we, we pay a lot of money. We pay almost $3 million a year to PBS for access to, to their schedule. And it's a 24 seven schedule. But stations as Sarah and, and Hillary was saying, Stations have the, the freedom, thank God, to specialize, to customize that schedule based on a handful of things, right? Much of it has to do with audience. So, um, and, you know, local content, certainly the stuff that individual stations might produce. And what we have in our agreement with PBS, there are certain things we must do, like kids programming, for example, is part of our charter, right? The reason that PBS stations around America schedule many hours, as many six or seven hours of kids programming a day as part of our agreement to be part of this federated system. But stations have a lot of flexibility and it's driven much by what's happening inside uh, each community. So I know we've got some people from, somebody's here from um, um, Austin, Kayla, are you? Their schedule is a little bit different than if you're here in San Diego and you watch KPBS. And that's because of the, uh, the specialization we've been able to um, to put into place. Now, PBS Plus allows the stations another opportunity, another uh, library, right? Sarah, library of, of opportunities. Now, PBS Plus, those are programs that are still PBS quality, great stuff, many independent productions, a lot of stuff coming through the pipeline that just for various reasons can't make it into the primetime schedule. You know, the primetime schedule is from eight to 11. There ain't much space there. And as Sarah was saying, and Hillary, you know, there's, it's, it's just, it's so competitive to get into prime time in American television these days. So PBS Plus gives the stations an opportunity to sort of cherry pick some of the, the programs that they feel or through their experience is gonna match with what's happening in town. So here in San Diego, if it's anything to do with the Southwest, you know, Latinx issues, the military, right? GI Film Festival, you know, gives us an opportunity to select. And then uh, on the digital side is this, huge opportunity that we have to sh share content because when you go to the PBS website and if you sign in as a user, right, it localizes to your community. So if you're in San Diego and go to the PBS website, it'll be localized to KPBS and then gives you access to a lot more content on the digital side. And that digital material, by the way, is terrific. If you aren't, you know, a fan or if you aren't following YouTube or on your passport, you should. There's a lot of terrifically, terrifically inventive stuff that's happening. Um, and then add that to the mix, right? Michael's work at ITVS, and ITVS is part of 
the PBS NPS, the master program schedule, but also there's material that ends up on the PBS plus side. So what that all leads to is this station focus, the station centric um, uh, attitude we have in public television, which I wanna point out is incredibly different than what you have on the commercial side. So it might be maddening or incredibly opportunistic, right? Depending on what side of the fence you stand on. But in the public television sphere, we have an opportunity to customize our content to better address the needs of our audience in each one of our communities. Again, if you're here in San Diego or if you're in uh, San Francisco or, or Austin or Washington, DC, it's gonna be a little bit different. And that is the beauty of the public television system. It's also maddening, and I know this firsthand because of all the people we work with here in town that wanna to get on public television, right? They wanna get out there and it is not easy. There are many opportunities and we're gonna to continue to discuss them today. Um, so again, I, you know, forgive me, I wanted to, that, that was my soapbox there a little bit. I just wanted to share a bit more con, uh, context to all of y'all here um, because that's really important to keep in mind. We wanna help you get your stuff to a wider distribution and um, we'll be answering questions uh, a little bit more. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for um, indulging me, um, my federated system of craziness in the public television station, but it all works, man. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing when it works. Okay, now I'm gonna hand over to my friend, Jody Silly, who's the founder uh, of the Film Consortium San Diego and a partner here with KPBS. We've been partnering with Jody for seven years now. Um, they help us with the KPBS Explore Local Content Fund. Um, and of course the GI Film Festival, she helps to organize a lot of the films and a lot of local stuff. And she's also terrifically involved with a lot of the local film festivals here in town. So I'm gonna hand over to Jody and she's gonna talk a little bit more about local film production. Jody, you are up next. Thank you so much. Hi everybody, I'm Jody Silly with the Film Consortium San Diego. And thank you, John, for the introduction. Uh, and yeah, we work really closely here in San Diego with our uh, local filmmakers in an effort to bring networking, education, screening, funding, and distribution opportunities to locally produce content. And uh, we're about eight years in. We started uh, working with KPBS seven years ago and started our organization about eight years ago. So that a great partnership with KPBS. And you know, first I wanna highlight um, what John mentioned, which is the KPBS Explore program. And that's something we've done for several years where we created, it's ultimately a film fund for locally produced content that would work on the KPBS platform that would reach KPBS audiences that is at the quality uh, level, diversity level, um, creative approach level that KPBS and public broadcast expects from uh, content that is released on their channel. So I'd like to start and talk a little bit about that because here in San Diego, if you're a San Diego filmmaker, that is one of the few op opportunities for funding for films uh, here in our own city. And I think it's important to discuss just sort of what it is uh, that, that makes that program so unique. One, as mentioned earlier, you still own the content. It's a licensing agreement with KPBS, anything that is selected. Two, it is very, very competitive. I think we had two, over 200 applications and ultimately ended up only funding a handful of projects. Um, and three, you know, after you know, working with hundreds of people through this, it really does and did show the gap between people, uh, filmmakers understanding of distribution and the realities of distribution of the films that you've produced or want to produce. Oftentimes people will come into those uh, sessions and pitch ideas that are just not even close to what would even show on a public broadcast station or just not understand like what the station is looking for, what the audience is, uh, what the uh, type of stories that they're looking for, or that's in some cases, and oftentimes those films or those shows or those documentaries already exist in the public broadcast space, maybe playing right now on KPBS. And they're just, you know, uh, they've pitching an idea that ultimately, you know, isn't, 
new to the to the platform. So, you know, with the KPBS Explore program, you know, I highly recommend people in San Diego, filmmakers look into and explore that. But I think it brings up a big, uh, really important as an educator thing that I try and get across to all my students is you, you know, your responsibility as a filmmaker is to educate yourself understand the different opportunities that are out there, understand what kind of film you're making and who ultimately will end up watching it, understand if your film is not either at the quality level or is a type of film that will uh, attract distribution, understand the work, the legal process, the accounting. When you get to the level of distribution, there is a lot in play and KPBS Explore local programming, uh, uh, local content program is a, a prime example of, you know, and had the value of looking into and understanding what the KPBS wants. And that information is out there, research, conversations, emails. It's very clear what we want. Um, what, if, what filmmakers need to do is take that into account and they decide what they're going to pitch and what they want to make. Now, you know, my main expertise is with film consortium and we work as ultimately like a real life film school here in San Diego, we work to build up and train filmmakers and help them at different parts and in, in, in different stages in the process. And we have worked with many, many filmmakers at varying stages in the process. There's making your short film, the distribution on making your short film and where that's going to go is going to be very different than let's say a documentary or a web series or a feature. Um, and if you really want to get distribution, I mean distribution in the commercial sense, the expectations are very, very uh, different than let's say getting your film into a film festival or you know getting it viewed on like a unique website that's showing like a specific type of genre. So you know, a, a couple things I just wanted to really point out to 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 add to this conversation is know what kind of film you're making know what the opportunities and distribution opportunities for that film are, research it, educate yourself, learn, go to school about that, take classes. Uh, it is very complex. So the more you know, the more success you're going to have. And, and oftentimes there's the film you wanna make and then there's the film that will get distributed. So take into consideration when you're planning a film, take distribution into into consideration before you even make the film. Think about that. Where's this going to end up? What is that? Where do I want this to end up? Research. If you want it on Netflix, figure out what Netflix wants. If you just make a film in a vacuum and then show up at Netflix, chances are it's not going to meet the criteria and the expectations that they have. But if you really educate yourself, understand the business side of film distribution and be realistic with where you are at in your career, you have a much greater chance. So just to kind of wrap this up, uh, I, you know, backing up um, as well, the you want to make a film that people want to watch. You want to make a film with a great content, uh, audience appeal, name, you know, even like named talent or recognizable people in it, high production value. Ultimately, making a great film will get you a lot further than, you know. Um, that really gets you far, but you have to understand the business side of it and what the requirements and expectations are of the distribution platforms that you're looking at before you even put that pen to paper or decide what script you're going to uh, get the rights for. So, you know, and I, I really um, encourage people to find mentors, the legal assistance, the, the lawyer, the need for a lawyer has come up a couple times here and I, I, gotta, I gotta emphasize that. The need for a lawyer and mentors who can help you make the right decisions uh, and education to help you understand the very complex process of distribution would be uh, you know, a, a really key to getting distribution for your film um, in, in a way that uh, when you make it or the current film that you have too, even understanding what to do with current films. So, Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you very much. And thank you for your partnership over the years too. Um, when we started the Explore program a few years ago, thank, thankfully Jody was uh, just at the beginning of launching the film consortium. And uh, we started the Explore program 
uh, quite simply so that we could um, grow our own because we knew that it was important for KPBS to reflect our community. And the way to do that is to develop relationships with the creative community. And I, sh and I hasten to point out that the Explore program is not just for documentaries and TV series, it's also for podcasts and web, web series, which has been incredibly fun. It's the best part of my day is to work on the Explore project. Um, well, let's pivot here. I wanna, um, there's room for questions here and we'll get to them. The first, I just wanna throw out a bit of a softball. Uh, if you, it's to all of our participants here today and Hillary and, I'm going to go to you first because you got to start a few minutes ago. When someone comes to you, when a filmmaker comes to you and says, I want to have my film on public television. In 50 words or less. <laughs> no. What kind of advice do you give them? Like, what are you saying to filmmakers about their their distribution methods? Mm -hmm. uh, before I answer your question, I also want to just echo something that that Jody just said beautifully. Before you put pen to paper, think about your audience, think about where your film's gonna wind up uh, and keep that in mind during your creative process. Because a lot of the times we work with folks who haven't uh, kept that part of things uppermost in, in their planning. And uh, they wind up with a finished product that may have some issues for public television. So think, think about where your project is going to be going from the get-go. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, but to answer your question, what's the first step? So um, there, there are actually a couple of different ways. I highly encourage uh, filmmakers to get in touch with their local public television stations because there are programs at other, uh, like, like uh, KPBS Explore, in, at other organizations as well if you're not based in San Diego. They're um, part of what public television stations want to do is help le help uh, local creatives get their work out there. And here, there's such a KPBS has such a strong commitment to that, which is wonderful. But get involved with your local public television station first. Um, after that, if they are behind you, great. Perhaps they'd be interested in presenting your program to the system. Wonderful. Um, we also do take submissions from independent producers, but we're going to want to see work that's developed. Uh, we don't really want ideas. We want to see treatments. Uh, we want you to have a solid understanding of uh, your budget and all how all of your pieces are going to be coming together. So start um, with a good package. Uh, make sure that you know what you're talking about. Uh, when you bring something to, to KPBS or to an entity like APT. I hope that helps answer. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, Sarah, what do you normally say? Um, Hillary, that was great. I'm going to steal some of your bullet points whenever I get a general question. But no, um, to back up what Hillary said, not have, yes, we want to see developed material. So having a solid description or a treatment or a deck along with something to look at. So while sometimes I know people are still working on their films and they can only show us a few minutes, a few minutes goes a long way. And um, for those who have dealt with the public media system, knowing that funding, funding is going to be reviewed. And so I always say to either first time filmmakers or even, um, you know, filmmakers who are coming to BBS for the very first time, but they've been around for so long, please send us funding info because that is going to be the first hurdle you're going to have to get over. And once you're over that, then it's, you know, pretty much smooth sailing. And also think about timing because this is ha this happens a lot where someone reaches out to you, they have a great film and they're like, well, we want this on PBS within a month or two months. And it's like, no, we're thinking so far out. So I always tell people try to think five to six months out and that will save you a lot of hassle. And I'm glad you brought up funding as well, Sarah, because the, the thing about public television, um, all public media for that matter, <laughs> is that we are obligated to be transparent about where the funding comes from. So if you have funding for a project that you expect or you would like to have in the public television pipeline in some respect, you really need to be transparent about your funding sources and be clear to your funders that they need to be acknowledged and identified. So if you've got a stash of secret money somewhere, <laughs> right, it ain't going to fly. 
because it needs to be, it's part of, it's part of our, our agreement, right? As a nonprofit media organization, that's what we do. And it's the reason that people support us is because we are so transparent. So we've got a couple of questions here and I'm going to go to, let's see here. I'm going to go to uh, Marcy first and then to, uh, and then to Nina again. Um, if you have just a reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, Marcy, do you have a good question? Go ahead. Yes, I believe um, it's been answered already uh, from oh. Hillary regarding going to the local um, KB, KPBS first. Um, my question was distribution on the national level, if you have local interest um, for a documentary series that deals with local interest, how can that go national? Um, but I'm going to look at the local first and see how that can work. All right. Well, thanks, Marcy. Uh, I think that's a good idea, but you guys want to weigh in because look, if it's a really good film about a local issue, you know, what is it? You know, think globally, act locally, right? I mean, if it's right. a really good, you know, if you're really doing, if you got a good film, a good film is a good film. You guys want to hop in there on that, Hillary? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, very, very good point. Uh, there are universal um, stories, I think, uh, that may feel local at first glance, but I think uh, a national audience would probably be able to appreciate them uh, in many ways. So, uh, but your, but your, I would say your local public television station would have a sense of that. Uh, they would okay. be able to tell you whether something has national appeal. Um, or again, as an independent producer, you could certainly um, send in something to, um, to APT and we would be able to tell you, well, this is a little bit too narrow. Why don't you try contacting X, Y, or Z first? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Sarah, you wanna weigh in? I just was gonna say uh, one of my, when I stepped into the role, one of my bullet points moving forward was we, four plus is just kind of finding our regional stories. They definitely, um, we don't have a ton and we wanna find, we wanna get content from stations that normally don't produce for us. So um, don't, it is always good to go to your local station person as Hillary said, they will be able to give you some feedback to be like, you know what, actually this could be elevated to the national system. Um, but please don't ever think that we might not be interested in it because I know I'm always looking for more local stories. Yeah, Michael, you, I'm sure you receive a lot of, if you will, regional or smaller topic films. Yeah, and similar to what Sarah was saying, we, we really want to find stories that aren't coming from the typical media hubs of New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. So it's very important to us that we can find, uh, you know, attract applicants from, from across the United States. Um, I think, you know, again, it's a very competitive landscape. So I think the thing to keep in mind is, well, there's production values, that's one thing, but also just in terms of storytelling, you know, I think the question I usually ask producers is, what would be the point of entry for a viewer, no matter where they live? So if, it, you know, the regional stories have specifics that make them attractive, and also if you work alongside the people that you're depicting, then there's authenticity, right? Because you know those communities. But there's going to be maybe, uh, you know, some context needed. And then the storytelling has to be rich and emotional and the characters relatable so that anybody would say, I want to stay tuned rather than reach for the remote. And so, yeah, regional stories are very important uh, to the public TV system because we don't want it just to be about people living in a handful of cities. Excellent. Thanks for that, Michael. Okay. Nina, you're up. You here still? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I got kicked off for a moment, but um, Jody, I've got a qu question. Um, so uh, are there specific resources uh, on the website that will po point to like, um, cause it sounds like it's pretty educational, the film consort consort consortium consortium of san diego um like specific resources for distribution and funding for short films and then can you explain you said i don't know if it's funding or distribution is really competitive and you only like there were like 200 um submissions and you selected a handful of pro uh projects what that what that was yeah so um in terms of distribution for short films there really isn't a lot of distribution for short films. 
there are kind of unique genre specific websites that might uh, sign a licensing agreement with you for your horror film or your LGBTQ film or your uh, comedy uh, because they're focused there. Short, f and you may be, you end up in an anthology for horror films. There's just not a lot. I mean, film okay. festivals, you know, short films, it surprises me because given that we like to take our information in short bites nowadays, I'm right. always waiting for that opportunity to, to pick up. Them. Yeah. I don't, I have not seen it. And I would add on top of that, that, you know, the film festivals are really the path of short films. It's um, getting your work out there, getting it seen, meeting people, uh, and potentially meeting people who can help fund, you know, a, feature, a bigger project. A bigger sure. Project. So, you know, sure. I hope as, as time progresses, there's more paid distribution opportunities for, for short films, but I haven't really seen it. Uh, okay. The other question you had yes. was about funding. Was about KPBS okay. Explore. So okay. For that program, uh, which will open up later this summer, we take applications for filmmakers to pitch an idea to KPBS and sort of uh, create a, a proposal for something, either a web series, documentary, narrative film, TV show, or um, podcast. Narrative film, not narrative shorts. We do. I wouldn't say we have, oh. you know, accepted so many of those. Okay. So, you know, but, but it's, it's still a possibility. A possibility. Okay. And uh, over the years, actually, uh, we have, uh, we've started playing more narrative shorts on KPBS as part of our different film challenges. So we've sure. definitely played narrative shorts locally. Maybe John can speak a little bit to answer that one, but yeah. But what I was mentioning was that, you know, we had, uh, it's very, funding and distribution is very competitive, period. Sure. Uh, but with KPBS and the Explore program, like we had 230 submissions and we ended up selecting, you know, a handful of, of shows and- What's a handful, like 20 or like three? I about 10. 10. And then uh, in the different years, uh, we funded between, you know, two and seven. So the Explore project, um, we go from the submissions, then we go to a pilot phase. So we've actually, a couple of years ago, which was a stroke of brilliance, I think it was probably Jody's idea, is to actually give, a, give, give some money to do a pilot because many of the projects came in without anything. And we really need to, you know, as, as everyone else, we, we kind of need to see something. We have a pilot phase, which usually involves about 10. Right. And then from there, we will, we kind of narrow it down and some might go into the pipeline right away. Some might need more development. I mean, it's just, it's just a, it's a mechanism for us to handle all of the submissions and kind of figure out what works. And, you know, as the, as, you know, as we sort of think about what's successful, you know, I, I'm a local snob, you know, I'll be the first to say that the KPBS is not a place where we distribute nationally because it's not a business model that, that my team and I can sustain. So we look primarily at what happens locally. Is it something that can serve our audience? Is it something that you know reflects the diversity, you know, the culture that tells the stories of San Diego? And ultimately, we start there, and then it becomes, you know, can they execute it? I, I, I have to emphasize this. I can't emphasize this enough. Is that we have to? We are in a fairly tight. <laughs> budget window usually lasts about a year. So we we really want to work with partners who can get the thing done. Because KPBS, we provide seed funding. You know, we don't provide you enough money to do the whole thing. And I know there are some of our production partners on this call right now who can probably attest to that. You know, we want to help, but we can't afford to pay for the whole thing, right? That's sort of how we 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 can do that is to just to help seed the project. You then have to, the filmmaker or the producer has to answer the question, well, how much money am I going to have to raise? And if I don't raise it, can I finish the thing? And we can only work with partners that can finish it regardless of right. what happens, because we got a year to do this thing. So um, anyway, that's more than y'all probably wanted to know about the Explore project. But if you're interested in your local, um, it opens in July. Okay. So moving on. Thank you, Jody, for all that. Great question. Nina. Okay. We've got a question from Janice, then Brian, then Ed. Uh, Janice, you up? Where are you here? Hi, yeah. Would you consider subtitled films? Sarah, Hillary? Michael? Oh, 
Yeah, um, 100% yes. Um, and thankfully, some of the independent um, films that I've been getting submitted to plus are subtitled, I, I want more programs that are subtitled. And, and then on the uh, national side, as well as the plus side, I work on um, a lot of foreign language dramas that we submit out through the station. So I've been working on a lot of subtitled content lately. But yes, please send us subtitled material. I, I would say I would say we do too. Um, but we would want to, you know, a lot depends on what you'd be presenting to us. So we'd want to, we'd want to just uh, take a look at the entire project before we would commit. Thank you. Michael, you, you want to add? Yeah, I would just add, we're always open to uh, stories in, in any language uh, that would be subtitled yeah. or international stories. Yeah. I'd have to say that Subtitle films give us an opportunity to expand the diversity of what we offer, right? Because oftentimes, you know, we there's you know we've been excluding those films because nobody wants to sit and watch read subtitles, but that is absolutely not true for the public television audience. They have this huge, this voracious appetite for stories from everyone and anyone, and um, so yes, right? Subtitled films are. Perfectly great, thank you. Okay, so who is next? Uh, Brian, you have a question, where are you? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks to the uh, presenters, this is really helpful. Um, so I've, I've sort of started to figure out this, um, you know, how to crack the distribution code. I was able to get a film aired nationally on APT. So thank you, Hillary. We worked uh, with WFSU as the presenting station. Um, they were able to handle that. Question I have um, is for Sarah. So I've got, a, um, a short documentary I'm gonna be working on this summer in partnership with the Emmett Till Interpretive Center in Mississippi. And um, I was thinking Real South might be like the ideal um, venue for that, but um, I have not worked with Mississippi Public Television before. Um, I, I just wondered how, how would that, something like that work out? Would, uh, would I request that they be like, my presenting station or start having conversations with them now? And just, I guess in general, what is a typical path for a short film getting on Real South look like? Um, so I love working on Real South and I love the team at uh, PBS North Carolina. Uh, so yeah, so I do know that this summer they will open for submissions. And since uh, Mississippi Public Broadcasting is one of the core stations that submits material, I would recommend reaching out to them. But um, after um, this panel is over, and I know that Claudine's going to share our contact info, I'm happy to put you in touch with the Real South folks as well um, to kind of get more on that process. But um, no, um, Nick, who runs it, like we every year, I'm always, he, while I know we always have to have features, I'm always like, please, please, let's do some more shorts. Um, so yeah, so I'm happy to hear that you're working on that. Yeah, and with, I, I, get, I don't, just with the shorts, what's the typical path back? That's not like a, uh, you know, standard length program that would air as part of the series that they work as specials or how does... So within Real South, they technically are, uh, they do run by themselves, um, unless two are thematically linked, then they'll run back to back to fill an hour. And then for PBS as a whole, I I used to, when I used to work on a festival, I would curate the shorts, shorts program. So they're actually my favorite. Um, so I have been on the hunt for people to submit more shorts programming. And also because with station scheduling, a lot of times we stations find themselves stuck when they get a, a 90 minute program and trying to fill that last half hour. So I really am trying to build up our library of content of shorts programming across, you know, many different themes. Um, so I'm hoping more and more people will submit shorts and ideally anywhere between 25 to 45 minutes is a, a great length. And if I could chime in there too, we are always looking for well-crafted half hours. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that we love <laughs> to see. So, cool. Well, th thank you so much, y'all. I seriously appreciate that. Uh, you're welcome, Brian. Thanks for the question. And I also want to point out that you know digital distribution is also an opportunity too, because if you have some shorts that are you know five, ten minutes long, is opportunity. And stations, believe it or not, have. Uh, need for those on broadcast so okay ed we got ed jonah and then i think uh, scott and audrey are up let's try and get through those ed where are you there you are yeah we can't hear you though now now can you hear me okay yes hi i just have thank you very much for this panel this is awesome 
I just had a quick question uh, based on an experience I had a few years ago where a station said, oh, we love your film. Uh, we can't pay you any money, but we'll give you a spot for sponsors at the end. And they had like a formula for time. Is that a normal model? Is that still going on? That's my question. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Hillary. I, you're yes. Up. Yes. Uh, yes, that's exactly it. You um, have the ability to have a sponsor at the top and the tail of your program. You have 60 seconds at the top and tail of your program to be able to sell what we call underwriting spots. Uh, that's where a sponsor would go. So the model is that that's how most producers recoup their funds when they make investments in their own projects. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, Ed. But don't forget that those things have to meet the FCC uh, guidelines if it's going to be on broadcast. And sometimes that's no easy needle to thread. Right. Okay. Thank you. But there's, there's where working with a station or having someone who really can help you with that language and how it's be presented. Or if you go through APT or PBS, they can really help you understand what is and is not allowable. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. 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 Uh, Jonah, I think you're up next. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. All right, cool. Uh, thanks so much for all of this. Uh, yeah. So I have done a lot of short films, a lot of festivals, never with ambitions for distribution up until my next project, the one that I just finished um, principal photography for. So everything has been fun, sketch comedy stuff. I'm a second city guy. I teach there now in Chicago. Um, but this next project, it's a little bit more ambitious. It's uh, a pilot, but it's an hour long comedic uh, episodic. So it was suggested to me by a, a television writer, someone that's successful that I know through Second City to create a short film version of the pilot. Uh, to help in kind of like what you're talking about, having something to show, especially as someone that hasn't tried to go the distribution route before. So we just finished that. We did it as like a seg production, high-end stuff. I just was kind of curious to hear from your perspective how much a short film that's nine minutes, uh, is if that's really helpful or not to trying to get this kind of hour-long show into production and distribution. Anyone? Michael, do you want to? Talk about, uh, and Jody too, about, about, about yeah. the production process. So uh, just to qualify, you know, I can really only speak about how we support nonfiction. Uh, and I think that it's quite different, you know, from what I understand in terms of the, you know, using a short narrative as a proof of concept, you know, to try to then get interest in, and buy in for um, a longer version or a series. With documentaries, we occasionally see short form documentaries submitted as the work sample as a proof of concept for a longer version. And I, it's, it, I would say it's, it can be helpful because it demonstrates that you've made a film and it went in festivals and all that. Um, it can be a little tricky, though, sometimes because if you're just saying I'm telling the same story but longer, that might, you know, we have to understand a little bit more why does it need to be longer. So sometimes we see like, well, we made a short about one character, but here are two other characters whose stories are similar overlapping, and that's why we want to make a feature. And so that's usually what we see at ITBS. And I would add, you know, it can help and it can hurt. It depends. Uh, it depends on the quality of it. If you create something that maybe that you don't have a full budget for, and therefore that suffers, the quality suffers for that reason, then that'll probably hurt your chances of getting finance and distribution for a project. Um, also, you know, sort of what has been said today is oftentimes you're working with like a producing partner or there, you know, maybe your distributor has some say. Um, keeping in mind, if you've already sort of figured out what this is, you need to be open to the finished product being different than the short and being, and being very clear that, you know, this is an example of our, the quality we can produce, but the, that that finished product, that that feature or that longer form content is a uh, potentially a different entity entirely. Different actors, different, I'm, I'm speaking specifically to narrative, uh, different actors, different storyline even, you know, that, that there's some understanding that the, the process uh, may change the end product. 
Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Jody. Okay, Scott, Audrey, and then um, I think Janice is up. And if there are any other questions, we are we're going to go a little long here. I hope you all are okay. Um, if you need to run, that's fine. Um, our guests, we have probably another five minutes or so. Is that okay? All right, Scott, you got a question? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. So I'm currently working on a feature length documentary, and uh, it's my first major undertaking. I think similar to what Jonas went through and uh, got about halfway through the project and didn't consider the legal ramifications, signed release forms, you know, insurance and that sort of thing. So now I'm faced with a bunch of interview footage that I'd love to keep, but some of the people might be a little reluctant to sign because it's, it's regarding a very controversial case here in San Diego. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, feelings that might be hurt sort of thing. So there's some people who are not necessarily interested in signing unless I get E&O insurance. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out to try to navigate sort of the legal and insurance waters. If I am able to get E&O insurance, does that sort of, dare I say, trump um, getting release forms or I'm not sure how to proceed. I'm trying to get everybody to sign the forms, but some are a little reluctant and some are willing to sign. So I'm not I'm not sure where to go and what, if anything, I can use um, from their interview footage. I'm, um, I'm happy to speak to that and, and others please chime in if, as, as it relates to being a, a distributor. Um, so, you know, it is critical, you know, for you to bind before you have any sort of broadcast and in order to, to you know, you'll need a lawyer's opinion before you can even get an ENO policy around anything that isn't covered by releases or licensing or a fair use opinion. So, um, because you're suggesting that the subject is uh, controversial, uh, I guess that refrain we've had today uh, get a lawyer <laughs> and just, you know, make sure that they understand, you know, who you don't have coverage for in terms of releases. And it would be ideal to have releases. Uh, occasionally when you're working in a con controversial uh, territory that you know there may be reasons perhaps why certain subjects wouldn't have a release but it, there has to be a very clear case for why you can proceed and why any you know uh, insurer would feel comfortable in, in an insuring your film if or with any unreleased subjects so it's very important to get legal opinion and then for everybody who hasn't shot anything yet but wants to you know shoot a documentary uh, just, I would suggest that you plan on uh, finding a solid um, release uh, template and making sure you have everybody sign them, especially minors, but basically uh, everybody who is an, a willing participant in your film. Absolutely. Anybody else want to chime in on that? No. Yeah, lawyer. It's it's so important, and as a as a as a as a partner of KPBS, as a partner and potential funder for some films, and again, our friends will attribute uh, attest to this. You really need E and O insurance. You need something that's going to protect you because at the end of the day, um, it's your film, and you just got to ask yourself: Is it worth it? If you don't have that person's permission to do something or to include their interview or whatever, it might, or their song, right? I mean, can't can't forget about uh, the uh, the music rights. Um, is it worth it? Because someone somewhere is going to get sued or has been sued for a lot of money because of something they did or did not do or forgot to do. It's just so important to do to make sure that you're covered legally. Um, because the station, you know, we're, we indemnify, you know, we've got an indemnity clause in our contract that's like three pages long, right? To make sure that we are not at all, KPBS is not at all held um, liable for that kind of stuff. So it's just so important. And as far as going back, Scott, I think you're just going to have to go back because if you don't have releases from those guys or from your previous interviews, I, I, you're going to have to, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't think you can either that or just, you can't use it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, I do. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you. I've got, uh, um, Audrey, you've got your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. I do. Thank, thank you so much for, uh, doing this panel and allowing us all to speak. It, it's all been wonderful. Um, a little bit of background of me. Um, I'm, I'm currently working with like a really small animation team as like a writer. And, you know, we spent uh, 10 years in pre-production, just like side hustling and creating um, a concept from script um, to like all the previs that's been done. And, you know, we're trying to take this and 
a more startup direction. Um, and so we're, we're running into the hang up of like trying to look for outsourcing for production and then um, finding out that like, uh, as, as we go that route, outsourcing um, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, even for like a short animated film. And, and so that's been relatively challenging. So I think one method has been looking at like crowdfunding, but I think in terms of um, like pro producers or potentially uh, best, um, investor or venture capitalists, um, what what other recommendations might might you have so that we can you know can uh, you know corner some funding and potentially like shift toward a more like startup um, and and you know make this more of like an operation rather than like a side hobby. Uh, funding, uh, Michael, you want to start with that? Oh, so yeah, again, I guess I would qualify in terms of animation while used in documentaries, it, it represents kind of a very small percentage of the projects. Um, so I can't speak with a great authority about, you know, how you can raise money for animation projects. I would say that when we do occasionally see projects where they're proposing that they be primarily animated, we often see that they're woefully under budgeted because as you understand, animation is quite expensive. So I think, yeah, I mean, you're already on the path to understanding what it will cost. And then again, finding people who want to support uh, the work you're doing. I'm not sure if it's nonfiction or, or narrative and, and what are those outlets, what are, where are the outlets that would, um, where you would reach the kinds of audiences that you intend to reach, you know, look at those works that are similar to yours and see who's supporting uh, those works and, and that could help you kind of open some other doors. If, if I could add to we we are seeing a lot of crowdfunding uh, and some of it is very successful. Uh, so I mean that is that is a path that you could take. Um, but you know as you know it is an extraordinarily expensive venture animation so but best of luck with it. Thank you Jody, so much. Some, Jody, you have some thoughts about funding? Well, since you brought up crowdfunding, I had to <laughs> chime in. Uh, you know, those ultimately, and animation is not my expertise by any stretch. So, you know, I'm just sort of speaking generally about funding is, you know, you have a couple that there's, it's true to any business. Film is a business. Your film is a business. And in business, they say, you know, there's friends, families, and fools, people that will fund your film which is, you know, reaching out to people, you know, who support you and care about you, but that's a limited supply. They're going to care and support your project once, maybe twice. Uh, then there's crowdfunding and similar. It's just, that depends on the audience and the reach that you and your team have, but also that's limited. You can't do that every time you will, uh, you know, you kind of have to focus on the key project or the big project that you want to do because you can't keep going back to that well. And then there's investors and private money and funds and um, you know grants and things like that. Um, for narrative film, there isn't really grants. There's funders, there's investors, and that is a whole um, massive <laughs> uh, just breadth of information and, and process that you'd have to uh, go through to be able to go out and get large amounts of money for people who are looking to make their money back and get involved in the film industry and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it depends on where you're at and what the project is, you know, I believe as to what direction you go for funding. If I may add to, uh, hold on Mark, um, if I may add to about funding, um, um, which actually kind of takes us back to the very, very beginning. One of the things that Hillary was talking about is know what your film is about, okay? Because there's a lot of competition for funding. And in the public media world, you know, you're looking at, like as you said, you, you got your friends, you got your family, you have foundations, you know, you have some granting agencies like ITVS potentially. There are, there are a handful of them out there that, that specialize in, you know, funding this, the kind of content that you see in public television. There are commercial spon sponsors. There are, you know, local companies that might underwrite your project and become a, a, a sponsor of it. And, What's important is that you know what it is you're selling, right? 
it's so important, and you know this as experienced filmmakers, is that it's so important for you to say what your film is. Call it your elevator pitch. It's your core value. It's that thing that you can't sleep at night until you, you're done telling, right? If Christian Taylor is here with us today, she can tell you about her film that we saw last night. I don't see her here today, but everyone knows this, right? I mean, it's that thing you got to tell, that, that, one, that one thing that, you, that keeps you up at night and that you're not, if you can encapsulate that into, into a message, a core value of your film that you go and you talk to uh, funders about, um, you'll be a lot more successful because then they'll know what you're really doing. And at the end of the day, you want, you know, in public television, you're not gonna, um, your, your potential funders, I'm talking specifically about corporate sponsors. This is not the same for foundations, but a corporate sponsor, they're gonna support you because they want you to succeed telling your story, not because they're gonna sell widgets, all right? Because they're not. Uh, supporting public television or public media, public radio, a podcast, supporting that through a, a corporate sponsor is, is part of their, their image, part of their uh, message, their brand message, right? And they'll do that with projects that mesh with their core values. So, it's so important as you go through the pre-production process is that you're really clear about what story you're going to tell. And that, and that thing, like I said, that you just, that you just need to tell and, you know, Providence will follow. You'll end up finding maybe one, hopefully one company or more or individuals who run those companies who, who uh, really want to help support your project because they, they, they aren't going to be selling widgets. They're going to do it because they want to help you. They want to help, you know, that, that story get out there. And I hope that that's helpful to you, Audrey. Guys, look, we're at uh, 28 past the hour. Mark, uh, I know you had some questions about length and I'll say this out loud for, for the group. Um, an hour long documentary, an hour long program for public television is usually 56, 46. For reasons that are buried in antiquity, I do not know even myself why it should be that length. So 26, 46 for half hour docs, um, 86, 46 for um, 90 minutes, et cetera. Um, there are occasions where we air uh, oddly length programs like uh, Doc Martin or something else that's crazy. But for the most part, that's, you got 56 more minutes and 46 seconds to tell your story. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a lot of time and uh, Godspeed. Okay, yeah, we need to wrap this up. Any, anything else, anything else for the good of the, uh, the group here? I was, Closing I was, arguments. <laughs> I was just, I was just going to say that uh, the other funding option that we explored back in the '80s uh, was sponsorship. Um, when we did our how-to videos, if we were doing a mountain bike video as an example, we'd have uh, you know mountain bike manufacturers that were helping, and then but those are the VHS days and also DVD where you then send out the shows to people across the world uh, that purchased them. So that was a little different than the TV or the PBS model. Um, right. But I also agree, just real quick, saying that uh, you absolutely have to get a release form done while you're doing the interviews. If they refuse to do it before you start the interview even, then it's up to you to decide whether or not it was worth it, and let's don't interview them. Other than that, uh, thanks for all the great information. You guys do a great job. Hi, Jody. You did good on TV today. Thanks, Mark. Any closing remarks from our, our panelists before we go? All right. Hillary, Sarah, Michael, Jody, it's great to have you guys here. Um, really a lot of fun. We should do this. Maybe we'll do this next year. Yeah, I had a good time. Thank you for, in, for including us. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, and I've got some closing. Hold, hold on, don't go anywhere. Jeez, I almost <laughs> forgot. I've got like this whole page that Claudine needs me to read. Um, You're fine, John. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, um, I read it. <laughs> well, uh, we have the award celebration is Saturday night at 8 p.m. Pacific. Hope you guys can be there. There are still tickets available. It's all virtual. Some terrific, terrific films that you absolutely must see. Really pleased. Um, our award celebration on uh, Saturday is hosted by Tom Tran, which is terrific. Um, we'll present, oh, and a special message from Gary Sinise will be shared as well. Also, plenty of films yes to see. Online showtimes continue through Sunday. Video demand rentals are open through Wednesday of next week. Um, catch a film. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, I hope you uh, guys go out and make great films and that we see, uh, 
see you guys on TV in the not too distant future. Okay.